Through the storm, He is Lord of all. (laughs) See, we don't make Him Lord. He is Lord of all. Amen? Good morning, church. We stand here, we sing this morning, we listen to God's Word for that one reason. He's Lord of all. He gets all our attention this morning. Oliver Wendell Holmes, Sr., was a doctor in the 1800s. And as such, he was very interested in the use of ether. And so in order to know how his patients felt under its influence, he once had a dose of ether administered to himself. And as he was going under in this dreamy state, a profound thought came to him. He believed that he had suddenly grasped the key to all the mysteries of the universe. Well, when he regained consciousness, however, he was unable to remember what that insight was. And because of the great importance this thought would be to mankind, Holmes arranged to have himself given ether again. And this time, he had a stenographer present to take down this great thought, this mystery of the universe that he unlocked. The ether was administered, and sure enough, just before passing out, the insight reappeared. He mumbled the words, the stenographer took them down, and he went to sleep confident in knowledge that he had succeeded. Upon wakening, he turned eagerly to the stenographer and asked her to read what was uttered. What is the key to the mysteries of the universe? And this is what she read. The entire universe is permeated with the strong odor of turpentine. (laughs) That's it. Oh, the mysteries of life. Times would like a key to unlock the mysteries of life. Well, our section of Scripture today talks about a great mystery. In this case as well, you might be even surprised to hear what that mystery is. And although it may appear rather simple, it is quite profound. Of all that we might consider to be the mysteries of life or mysteries of the universe, the one mentioned in today's passage of Scripture may not seem that significant, but indeed it is. We're looking at the book of Ephesians on church matters. And the theme of church matters contains a double meaning. The church matters, those who make up the church matter, church does matter, And there are matters of the church to be addressed. Well, it isn't until we come to chapter 4 that Paul specifically deals with some of these issues. It it really isn't until chapter 4 that we see some admonitions for the church, some commands. The first three chapters are not about telling us what to do, but rather reminding us of who we are and what we have in Christ, and that's what we've been looking at, and we'll continue with that this morning. So look with me at Ephesians chapter 3. Ephesians chapter 3. And in a moment, we'll be picking it up in verse 1 of Ephesians chapter 3, verse 1. But before we look at the particulars, I want to point out something I think is rather important about the flow of thought here. As we come to chapter 3 this morning, Paul begins to pray. Then he stops and then digresses on the mystery that he had just been talking about in the previous section as we saw last week. And so in terms of structure, verse 1 begins his prayer when he says, verse 1, For this reason I, Paul, the prisoner of Christ Jesus, for the sake of you Gentiles. And then he stops mid-sentence. He doesn't pick up his prayer until we come to verse 14, when he says, for this reason, verse 14, for this reason I kneel before the Father. And then in verses 15 through 21, we have this amazing prayer, which we will look at next week. So so, so he begins his prayer in verse 1 that isn't continued until verse 14. So verses 
2 through 13 in a way serves as one long parenthesis. It isn't any less important. Matter of fact, Paul digressed because he felt that before they could hear this this heartfelt, profound prayer and and understand this prayer, they needed to be reminded of the truth he just spoke about. He must have thought that they were not ready to hear his prayer on their behalf until they better understood and applied certain truth. And so he stops and he kind of goes back to that this morning. That's what we have in front of us. Now, I, I have a confession to make around the section of Scripture we're looking at this morning. I feel so inept to grasp and then convey to you the cosmic significance and grandeur of the mission of the church as given to us here. God's program for the church goes beyond what I can put into words. Now, this is true in in some regard any time I speak of spiritual realities, but I am even more painfully aware of my inadequacies and the subject before us this morning. I'm reminded of George Washington Carver, the scientist who developed hundreds of useful products from the peanut. And he was asked once to share the origins of his ideas. And he said, well... When I was young, I asked God to tell me the mystery of the universe, but God answered, that knowledge is reserved for me alone. So I said, God, tell me the mystery of the peanuts. And God said, well, George, that's more nearly your size. (laughs) That's how I feel. And as I thought about these verses that speak to the magnitude of what we are caught up in by belonging to Christ, I had wished to take something smaller. Believe me. I said, I think I'm going to go to another passage. But my my confidence is this. The Holy Spirit is the true teacher, and He's able to move us to a better appreciation of, for God using us, His children, His church, for His purposes. And I hope by the end of our time this morning, you will have a greater awareness of the part we play in God's drama of redemption. And that we might feel the impact of the magnitude of what we are caught up in by belonging to Jesus Christ. And I want to say that second part to you again because this is the real takeaway. That we might feel the impact of the magnitude of what we are caught up in by belonging to Jesus Christ. I mean, why is it so critical that we feel the impact of the magnitude of what we are caught up in by belonging to Christ? Well, in this passage alone, there are three outcomes. Three outcomes. It influences our perspective, first of all. Secondly, it gives an incentive for being the church. And then thirdly, it invites us to live each day for something bigger than ourselves. That's really going to serve for our outline this morning. It influences our perspective. It gives an incentive for being the church. It invites us to live each day for something bigger than ourselves. So, first of all, it influences our perspective. It influences our perspective. I remind you that Paul's writing this letter to the church in Ephesians uh, from prison. At the time of this writing, it would likely be around the five-year mark of his imprisonment. He was arrested on false charges made by his fellow Jews. He had faced hearings before the Sanhedrin, before the governor of Rome, and even before King Agrippa. He was then taken to Rome as a prisoner with a soldier to guard him at all times in private quarters. So it's interesting here, based on that background, to see Paul's perspective. Look at verse 1 of chapter 3. He says, for this reason, I, Paul, the prisoner of Rome. No, that isn't what he says. He doesn't view himself as a prisoner of Rome, but as a prisoner of what? Jesus Christ, of Christ Jesus. He did not call himself a prisoner of the Jews. He did not see himself as a prisoner of King, King Agrippa or, or, or the governor of, of, uh, of Rome. Uh, he didn't see himself as a prisoner of that, but a prisoner of Christ Jesus. 
Now, is that a big deal? Yeah, it says everything about Paul's perspective. Yeah, it's a big deal. Paul knew the impact of the magnitude of what he's caught up in by belonging to Jesus Christ. He grasped that to some degree. See, perspective is everything. If we view our present circumstances on a human level only, then those circumstances control us. Paul did not have a human perspective on this. He wasn't all bent out of shape over the powers to be, for he saw himself first as under the control of Christ. He knew that these human institutions were in submission to God's agenda and plan, and so he was not going to be discouraged by the position he was in right now as being prisoner. A man approached a Little League baseball game one afternoon and and he went over to a boy in the dugout and asked him what the score was. And the boy responded, 18 to nothing, we're behind. <laughs> wow, the spectator, spectator replied, I, I bet you're pretty discouraged. Why should I be discouraged, the boy replied. We haven't even got up to bat yet. <laughs> That's a pretty good perspective. What hope? We haven't even got to bat yet. We're going to be Okay. Listen, at any given moment, it may look like we are behind, but we get last ups. Now, believer, do you need a little divine perspective right now? I do. I definitely do. I mean, are you finding it hard to keep hopeful with all that's going on in our world? Are we sending a message of fear and panic and despair to the younger generation? Know that there's a bigger picture than we can see. Even when we can't understand the divine purposes behind the mess, we are not subject to the plans and power of any man or woman or government. We are all prisoners of Christ, subject to Him and His plans and His purposes. Now, did Paul understand fully the purposes of God and His suffering? No, no, he didn't. But he, but, but he, but he knew His present and His future and His trials and every other aspect, aspect of His life were completely in the Lord's hands. You see, God is not pacing the floors of heaven, wringing his hands and going, oh, I don't know what to do with this mess. Sometimes that's our picture of God. He's got scratching his head. He's biting his fingernails going, I don't know what to do. Now, I'm not suggesting there's no room for concern and that our response ought to be one of indifference, but it matters when we can see every part of our life and all that is going on is part of a cosmic plan. It begins with remembering whose we are and who we belong to. We are prisoners of Jesus Christ first and foremost, even if we find ourselves stuck with the decisions of human institutions, human government, and human authorities. Because Christ said that Satan's plan cannot thwart the most important institution in the world, the church. Paul lived with total trust in God's purpose and saw himself as a prisoner of Jesus Christ. His was a divine perspective so he could react accordingly. I'm sure you've heard the quote. It's been said often. Perhaps I've even said it. But life is 10% of what happens to us and 90% of how we react. Paul's ability to see the magnitude of what he was caught up in by belonging to Christ influenced his perspective and his reaction to life. He not only saw himself as a prisoner of Christ, but as a steward. Verse 2, he says, Surely you have heard about the administration, which, by the way, is where we get our word steward or stewardship. Stewardship of God's grace that was given to me for you. Again, as we see the big picture and keep the big picture in mind, it puts ownership in the proper, respect, proper perspective. Because what do we really own? Everything we have 
belongs to the Lord, even our bodies, and have been given to us as stewards to manage and take care of. And, and next spring, seems a long ways away right now, I realize, but next spring, we're going to do a study on stewardship, and we'll see that it isn't just about our money and possessions. We're to be a good steward of our calling and of our spiritual gifts and of our time and of our opportunities, of our skills, of our knowledge. And as Paul mentions here, we are to be a good steward of the gospel. See, if you know Christ, then the gospel has been given to you and to make known to others. And knowing what we are caught up in by belonging to Christ influences how we view what we've been given and ought to push the advancing of the gospel high on our to-do list. That ought to be the central thing. D.A. Carson put it this way. He said, put the advance of the gospel at the center of your aspiration, our own comfort, our bruised feelings, our reputations, our misunderstood motives, all of these are insignificant in comparison with the advance of the gospel. Where's your focus been lately? Bruised feeling? Can you see yourself as a steward of the gospel? Do you see yourself as a prisoner of Christ? Lastly, Paul viewed himself as a servant. He says, verse 7, I became a servant of this gospel by the gift of God's grace given me through the working of his power. Now, what is a servant's task to do what he's told to do? A servant recognizes that he is under the authority of someone over him. He views himself as a person under orders. And we are all under orders. Even if you're a boss, of a company, you're still under orders from God. His life is not his own. He belongs to Christ. And so he continues in verse 8, Although I am less than the least of all God's people, this grace was given me to preach to the Gentiles the unsearchable riches of Christ. Now when Paul says there, less than the least of all God's people, it's nearly impossible to translate. Because the phrase there is one word in the original. It is the word leaster. Not good grammatically, but that's the word, leaster. He saw himself as small Paul. Now, this isn't some false humility on Paul's part. He isn't just saying this so that others would come around him and say, oh, that's not true, Paul, you're a great man. It's not what he's saying it. He's saying this in all sincerity. He's quite mindful of his past, that he persecuted Christians, and by doing so, in essence, he was persecuting Christ himself. He had a proper estimation of himself in which he knew of his sin and that without the work of grace in his life, he deserved to be separated from Christ for all of eternity. But you see, not only did God get a hold of this man, Paul, and convert him, he would call him to be part of God's work to get the gospel out to the Jew and to the Gentile. And Paul knew the thrill of sharing in God's cosmic plan. And it influenced his perspective. In the same way, when we feel the impact of the magnitude of what we're caught up in by belonging to Christ, it ought to influence our perspective. Secondly, I need to move to the second point. It gives an incentive. It gives an incentive for being the church. That's another outcome of when we feel the impact of the magnitude of what we're caught up in by being by belonging to Christ. It is an incentive for being the church. It's in verses three through six, and then in verse nine. We find the word mystery, mystery. It's used four times in this section. And we think of mystery. Our minds might go to Sherlock Holmes or, or, or Columbo or the X-Files or Criminal Minds or whatever sleuth-like figure pops into your head. We think of mystery, we think in terms of, of some kind of investigatory work to, to figure out these clues in order to solve this mystery. Many are seeking to find the, uh, the key to solving the mysteries of the universe. So we tend to place mystery in a category of things known to God but unknown to us. I'm reminded of, of William Phelps. He, he taught English literature at Yale for 41 years until he finally retired back in, in, in 1933. And marking an examination paper shortly before Christmas one year, Phelps came across this note written on the top of this paper of this exam by one of his students. And it said, God only knows 
the answer to this question, Merry Christmas. Huh. Well, Phelps returned the paper with this note. God gets an A, you get an F, Happy New Year. <laughs> we kind of see mystery and say, God only knows this. Well, in this case, this mystery is known to us. It is something that God has not kept from us. Well, what's the mystery? Paul goes on, verse 3, that is the mystery made known to me by revelation, as I've already written briefly. And reading this, then you'll be able to understand my insight into the mystery of Christ which was not made known to men in other generations as it has now been revealed by the Spirit to God's holy apostles and prophets. And he now tells us exactly what this mystery is. Verse 6, this mystery is that through the gospel, the Gentiles are heirs together with Israel, members together of one body, sharers together in the promise in Christ Jesus. And he mentions the mystery again in verse 9 to speak it as being hidden in the past but now made plain to everyone. Well, what is it? What is it that was unknown to the Old Testament believers and made known to Paul and now to us? It is the mystery of the church. It is the mystery of the church. See, the genius of the gospel is that in Jesus Christ and through his finished work on the cross, the Gentiles are now fellow heirs with Israel and members of of the same body. It's what we talked about last week from chapter 2, that the walls of hostility have come down and God made two groups of people into one new people, the church. What a statement of the wisdom of God. What a brilliant plan of the Almighty God to devise such a redemption as this. There is a miraculous togetherness of Jews and Gentiles, proving to us that there's no place in the church of Jesus Christ for separation and divisions. It's our unity that turns the heads of the unbelieving world. It's when the unbelieving world sees such diverse people getting along that they wonder, what, what's with this? And we answer, Jesus Christ. There's no other explanation. And if that isn't a high enough incentive for being the church to turn the heads of an unbelieving world, Paul goes one step further. Now, this is where I feel real puny, all right? This goes beyond what I can comprehend. And if you're still with me and your eyes aren't at half-mast here, we're going to come to the best part. We have the thrill of sharing in God's program. Look at verse 10. This is meaty stuff here. Verse 10 says, His intent was that now through the church... The manifold wisdom of God should be made known to the rulers and authorities in the heavenly realms according to his eternal purpose, which he accomplished in Christ Jesus our Lord. Now, let's just unpack this a little bit because we find here an incredible incentive for being the church. And we have to first ask, who are the rulers and authorities spoken of here? Well, these two terms, rulers and authorities, are found together in Ephesians 2.2. 2, when it's translated rulers of the kingdom of the air. In Ephesians chapter 6, verse 11 and 12, and we'll get there at some point, it's where these supernatural beings are aligned with the devil. And to speak of them as being in the heavenly realms is simply suggesting that they are not earthy beings, but live in another dimension. Now, while it's possible that the terms used here could refer to both fallen and unfallen angels. I think the emphasis is on the fallen angels. Now, if that is true, stay with me. If that is true, then what in the world is meant by the church being the manifold wisdom of God to these fallen angels? I mean, what does that look like? This is where it gets real big. Because what we are to show the world is that what God has put in place works. But even bigger than that, on a much larger scale than this, we show the fallen angels that God's brilliant, all-wise plan works whenever we get along. Now, verse 10 is an incentive for being the church. And quite frankly, it's not something I've, I've given a, lot, a whole lot of thought to. The rulers and authorities. 
the fallen angels, are watching this week to see if the church, if followers of Jesus Christ will live as though God is wise and that what He has put in place works. Have you thought of that? I haven't given a whole lot of thought to that. And when the church fails, Satan and his angels mock us, laugh at God, and quip, this is your plan for reaching the world? You don't look very wise. Each time we introduce another person to Jesus Christ, the unseen world of evil is shown the wisdom of God and that his plan still works. It shows them that their best efforts cannot overpower his plan. It shows them the futility of their intentions of destroying the church. You see, the church is a showcase of God's grace, of God's mercy, and when we live as joyful recipients of the riches of His grace, and when we live in a way that that pours out and maintains the unity of the Spirit, we show off the wisdom of God. I mean, do you see the, the thrill of sharing in God's cosmic plan? Can we agree? Can we agree based on that? Can we agree to let go of trivial stuff? Can we agree to let go of trivial stuff? I am as guilty as the next person. I'm chasing things that don't really matter. I'm getting hot and bothered about things that don't really matter. Now, this is the season for pumpkins. I don't know if you've picked out your pumpkin yet for this year. But I read about a a pumpkin farmer who was strolling through his rows of beautiful green leaves at the beginning of the season as as the acorn-sized pumpkins were starting to add dots on his landscape. He glanced down as he was doing this, and he noticed a clear glass jar. Curiosity got the best of him, so he took this clear glass jar over to one of his pumpkin buds, threaded the small pumpkin on its vine inside the open jar, and he left it sitting there in the field. Months later, with with that experiment long forgotten, the farmer was walking his land, greatly satisfied with the large, beautiful pumpkins that covered his patch. He looked down, and he noticed this glass jar totally intact, and he was startled to see it completely filled up with a little pumpkin that grew inside. The thin glass barrier had defined the shape of the orange mass within. The pumpkin was only one-third of the size it should have been. It could not go further than that. And I wonder, might that be the description of the church in America? Rather than than, than growing to its full potential, I'm not just talking about numbers here, growing to its full potential, that that it conforms to the shape of some external mold or some other model. I ask, what are the jars, glass jars, creating barriers for growth as a church? What jars do we need to break so that we can expand to the God-given shape for our church here in Laconia. What mold do we need to break out of in order to become the church that can see beyond our walls to something much, much bigger? I like how one writer expressed it. By concentrating day and night on your feelings, your potentials, your needs, your wants, your desires, and by learning to assert them more freely, you do not become a freer, more spontaneous, more creative self. You become a narrower, a more self-centered, more isolated one. You do not grow. You shrink. Let's let, let that sink in. We get so bent out of shape over minor things. And often our world gets so small because our focus is on our feelings, our wants, 
our needs, our desires. Oh, we need to feel the impact of the magnitude of what we are caught up in by belonging to Christ. It influences our perspective on a day-to-day basis. It gives us an incentive for being the church, for being followers of Christ. And lastly, it invites us. It invites us to live for something bigger than ourselves. Verse 13, by Paul's example, the invitation goes out to all of us. Look at verse 13. Really, let me read verse 12. It really speaks for itself. Verse 12 says, in him and through him, through faith in him, we may approach God with freedom and confidence. I mean, how wonderful is that? And then Paul says, verse 13, I love these words. I ask you, therefore, not to be discouraged because of my sufferings for you, which are your glory. How can he say that? Because he was driven by a bigger purpose than what was in it for him. He even was willing to suffer so that the church would be better off. Paul would do whatever it would take to see the church go forward. It was for their good that he suffered. How can he say this? Big picture. Big picture. He didn't want them to become discouraged over what he was going through because it's so easy to become discouraged and to lose heart. It is challenging to see how suffering and trials and the upheaval in the world can be moving to advance anything for God. Well, in Philippians 1, verse 12, you can jot it down, look at it later. In Philippians 1, 12, again, written while Paul was in prison, he says to the church, now I want you to know, brothers, that what has happened to me has really served to advance the gospel. He goes on to tell why this is the case. He says, because of my chains, most of the brothers in the Lord have been encouraged to speak the word of God more courageously and fearlessly. You see, just when Satan figures that take a good man down like Paul, that he wins. We get last ups. It only encourages more people to speak for Christ. It only advances the gospel. You see how God displays his manifold wisdom, his multicolored wisdom even in suffering. You see, this section of Scripture, yes, it influences our perspective, knowing that every minute we carry out what it means to be the church and live in unity and harmony. We're showing all of Satan and all of his demons that God's plan works. That's to be a great incentive, church. We're left with the invitation. An invitation to live for something bigger than yourself. An invitation to align ourselves with God's program, surrendering our own agenda to Him. An invitation to allow ourselves to feel the impact of the magnitude of what we are caught up in by belonging to Christ. It's an invitation to join in the thrill of sharing in God's cosmic plan. John Piper would have us picture in our minds a wise painter painting on a huge canvas with many brushes, most of them very ordinary and messy. The painter is God. And even though he's invisible, he intends for his painting to be the visible display of his wisdom. His canvas is huge. It's the size of the created universe. And God is painting with thousands and thousands of colors and shapes and textures a picture we call history with a center, center of the preparation, salvation, and formation of the church. And he's using thousands and thousands of different brushes, ordinary and very small, because every minute detail is crucial in his painting to display the wisdom of the painter. And all the holy angels stand in awe of the wisdom of God's grace. 
And all the demons must look at this painting and see the wisdom by which they were defeated. That just when God paints a dark color of suffering and persecution and trials and even death of one of his saints, the fallen angels begin to gloat. And God picks up another brush with orange and yellow and red and makes that darkness serve the beauty of his wisdom. And the demons gnash their teeth. Here's the invitation. God intends to use ordinary, messy, small paintbrushes on the canvas of history because every stroke matters. Will you be one of his brushes? Will you be one of his brushes? Will you trust him with the dark colors of life? Can you believe that that not one stroke will be wasted? That even the dark colors of suffering are painted on this canvas as part of the plans of God to show off His beautiful grace and His goodness. See, He knows what He's doing with your life. You can't always see it, but can you still trust Him? Will you be one of his brushes? Ordinary, messy, and yield to the wise hand that would paint with your life. Will you allow him to use you in spite of your past, in spite of your doubts, in spite of your inadequacies to show off the manifold wisdom of God's plan to redeem and fix broken lives? Let him use you to paint on his canvas this week. Because the unbelieving world and the cosmic world are watching you and watching me to see if God's plan still works. Let's show them, not in pride, but in all humility to our Savior.